Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer Laszlo Mizrahi, president of Respectability, a nonprofit organization that fights stigma and advances opportunities for people with disabilities. I am so delighted today to bring you a wonderful, fabulous poll briefing with Stan Greenberg is gonna run through some very, very important poll numbers for us. Um, it, the title is People with Disabilities and COVID-19, SNAP, Voter Access, and more. We have some very, very special uh, speakers, but I wanna first start off by thanking the Voter Participation Center, VPC, which is a research-driven nonprofit and nonpartisan organization dedicated to increasing the participation of unmarried women and other historically underrepresented groups in our democracy. Well, I must say that people with disabilities is sort of the definition of underrepresented um, groups in democracy. And, you know, so many polls do not even have disability as a crosstab or a demographic group. So we're so uh, grateful to this organization for enabling uh, us to have access to this data. Before we move to Stan Greenberg uh, to talk about the poll data though, I'd like to introduce my fellow board member, Oli Cantos. Oli Cantos is one of our board members. He himself is blind, he's an attorney, he is a leader in the disability rights movement, and he has three remarkable sons. And um, he is just part of the reason that we care so deeply about these issues. So let's go ahead and roll the tape from ABC National News talking about his family and their experience during this pandemic. You met them right here once our persons of the week and they were deserving. And tonight they're proving their strength and their determination again. You first met the Cantos brothers triplets from Arlington, Virginia, right here. They're blind and they're impressive. We named them persons of the week when all three of them became Eagle Scouts. Brand new Eagle Scouts, Leo, Nick and Steven Cantos. I don't think it would have felt the same if we had done it with exceptions or special considerations. I made it the same way as other Eagle Scouts. We met Oli, the dad who adopted them. He is blind as well, and they presented him with Eagle Scout pins too. I wear these with pride because, because they, uh, they made it to Eagle Scout. They are ambassadors of the possible. Last Monday, all three brothers tested positive for COVID-19. First, Leo was taken to the hospital, talking to our station, WJLA. It's really scary. I mean, uh, when I came to the hospital, I was like, what's going on, you know? I've never been this sick before. Then Nick, taken to the hospital too, Stephen isolating at home. And their father, Oli, has no symptoms, and he's had to keep a distance. But he is proud of their resilience. That resilience has come in handy now because the tough thing is not being able to be with them. Tonight, we are proud to report Leo is now going home. So here we go, guys. I'm leaving the hospital. Through those doors. So here we go. We're going outside. And tonight, his message. Hi, David. And we loved what he told us. One of the things that we learned uh, during Scouts and when I became an Eagle Scout is uh, not to give up, uh, even though sometimes uh, things aren't uh, easy to fight, and so I'm continuing to fight through it, and so are my brothers. Keep up the fight, Leo, Nick, Steven. We cheered you on years ago, and we are cheering you on tonight. This is Oli Cantos here, and I'm pleased to report that by this point, Leo, Nick, and Steven are safely recovering in isolation. They are doing better, and they are out of the woods. And for so many people who suffer from COVID-19, it is an extremely difficult situation. It is a ravaging disease as it is, but for persons with disabilities, there are additional considerations and additional challenges. And what ended up happening was because of the dialogue that respectability led through a series of, of town hall sessions, in this case, led by Janet Lebrecht and myself, we learned from grassroots efforts in, and, and feedback from the community that those who are part of the SNAP program were not able to use their, their card to shop online and to receive groceries. And so that really posed significant challenges. And that is what then resulted in respectability's activism efforts that have now 
enhanced uh, efforts to administer the program in 20 states with 13 additional states moving forward to uh, modify their programs to support people with disabilities on SNAP. And there are more than 11 million individuals who, who are recipients of, of SNAP. It literally has an impact on the lives of uh, uh, on their lives as as they are able to have greater access to food security and and that is why it is important and that this is what sets the stage for the discussion that is now to follow Jennifer this is so important and I really really thank you and so now we're going to turn it over to Stanley Greenberg who's going to walk us through some important poll data on this and other issues but um, only you and your family are inspiring to us because of your leadership and this issue is a core issue that impacts, as we heard, 11 million people with disabilities who use SNAP to eat. Thank you so much, Oli. Dan? Um, thank you very much. Thank you for what you do. Um, every, I mean, every, whenever I, whenever, whenever we collaborate, I'm inspired by everybody that you bring to the table. I'm, I'm in, and I'm inspired by the kinds of changes uh, that you're trying to bring in a country that have become so urgent uh, in the context of the pandemic. Um, we are uh, reporting um, on the, uh, the latest tracking polling that we have on the pandemic that we are doing with the support of CVI, um, Center for Voter Information, um, that has rushed into this uh, the, given the urgency and the kind of the scale of decisions and speed of decisions that are being taken. And what comes through this survey is the how the partisan polarization of the pandemic is now increasingly shaping both how people are experiencing it and what kinds of policies they are supporting. But as will become very clear here, that is, is in very sharp relief on how it affects the, those with disabilities and the disability families um, and the community. Um, and it's a very powerful message that I think people will see once we begin to go through these, the results of these 2000 interviews. So I'm gonna, and I'm gonna move through the slides, dwell, dwell on slides, but move them through them fairly quickly. It, it is important to notice, uh, these are the battleground states. There's 16 states, Donald Trump carried them by a point. This is not New York, it's not California. In, in terms of the political class and, and the elites, it's what they're paying most attention to because that's going to determine who the leaders are in the country. I want to start with the reaction to the, uh, the anti-stay-at-home demonstrators uh, because that, is, um, that begins to reflect the, the polarization uh, that America has gone through since the Tea Party revolt um, that led to Republican control of the federal government and many states um, starting in 2010. Um, the Tea Party was the heart of the Republican Party and it, it's still the base uh, for, Do for Donald Trump and how he achieved the office. But we should just should know the country is not with these anti-stay-at-home demonstrators. They're not with the governors uh, who are um, uh, urging people to move quickly um, to uh, open up. Um, they want to be more cautious, and you'll see that in the data here. Just in terms of the understanding the data, um, in yellow is a cool or negative, um, and, and the 63% is very negative. The upper part, 16, is the percentage who are very warm um, to them. So it's a very small percentage, a third of Republicans, but overwhelmingly independents and Democrats uh, reject the anti-stay-at-home demonstrators. Um, here we talk about governors who are ending stay-at-home orders to restart the economy. You know, one third, uh, you know, are warm or favorable to them, but half are not. Um, and if you, you know, a majority of Republicans are, but a quarter, you know, a, a quarter of Republicans um, are also also doubtful. And um, the country actually wants to be cautious in opening up the uh, the country. When when we ask people open-ended in this, uh, in this um, uh, survey, on a whole variety of questions, we decided just to, um, <laughs> particularly because people are at home and willing to respond to surveys, we asked people to give kind of open-ended responses. And here we read 
what the, you know, what the Georgia governor said. And just you should know that, you know, 69 percent, you know, gave negative responses to the idea of opening up the economy in the way Georgia was doing. Only 30 percent were positive. The other piece of this is a, and I think it's quite important to understand that people believe life is precious. And I think that is in part why we're seeing the reaction to the how casual people are about the idea of older people dying. Here we ask the question, Republican leaders are right to be focused on an economic crisis and getting people back to work, or I'm bothered that some leaders seem willing to have a lot more older people dying. And what you see here in reaction to that is that, you know, 81% of Democrats, 61% of, of independents overwhelmingly reject that, almost two to one. A quarter of Republicans, uh, you know, accept that as well. So there's some rallying amongst Republicans, but very broadly in the country, the idea that life is precious and we need to uh, uh, make policy choices um, that protect people is reflected here. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we, and we, uh, we asked open-ended in response to the Texas Lieutenant Governor who said, you know, talked about seniors um, being willing to make sacrifices, two thirds rejected that. Okay, let me focus on the, you know, the fear of family, you know, getting sick. And obviously there's a very high, you know, high, you know, high probability of risk. But what we're seeing in the country is a, um, even that, even that, you know, very objective fear runs through a partisan lens that polarizes the country that uh, affects people's willingness to see that they are their family is ill. If you look overall in the country, 37% have a high level of fear, most worried that someone in their family will get seriously, uh, you know, 46 uh, kind of dismiss the idea that um, they'll get sick. But if you look at that by party, you see that it's almost half of Democrats. It's still, you know, but drops to a third of independents and a quarter of Republicans. So that, you know, but as we know, this is obviously not by party. <laughs> this is real life experience and position that, you know, that affects that. Um, so if you look at by party, you know, with, you know, the moderates, you know, you have 36% who think someone who will moderate Republicans, uh, but amongst the Tea Party and evangelical Republicans, it's almost two thirds that are dismissive, that there's risk within their family. And if you look at by age, which is astonishing, uh, millennials, uh, the only 35%, uh, you know, only 35% you know, say there's low risk, but it jumps to 57% with baby boomers, 61% with silent generation. So the, you know, the oldest populations who have the most risk are saying they are least, you know, worried. And obviously, if you look at Hispanics and African Americans, you have, you have high percentage who worry about family members getting uh, you know sick. And if we look to the next slide, uh, you can see you know how this breaks out within the disability community. You know the um, you know for if you're talking about personally getting sick, um, you're dealing with higher numbers overall. But let's focus on family because that's what we presented before. Uh, the, uh, the disability community is like 46%, you know, much higher, 48% for a person with disability, uh, with a family member, 44% evenly split. Obviously, it's, it's a very different world if you look at the non-disability community, where all 66% are, ha you know, think there's low risk. So we're, we're dealing with a community rightly and can't, af can't afford the uh, partisan polarization. Um, and sees the real risks uh, to their, you know, to their families. Um, they are not part of this partisan polarization. All right, let me go to the uh, to people wanting to vote in uh, in safety, because one one of the most important things that's come out of this is a desire is a desire uh, in the in the country uh, for people to vote by mail. Um, you'll see here that the percentage has moved up four points on people wanting to vote by mail at home. Um, that's jumped with Democrats, uh, has it edged down with you know Republicans, but it's it's hit its top points with African Americans, millennials, um, and white college women. Uh, but there's a large majority 
uh, that significant populations who want to vote by mail. Next slide. Uh, when you look at this uh, in the disability community, what you see is, first of all, you have overall 51%, but it's 58%. And it's pretty, it, it's almost the same thing with whether it's a person with disability or, or a person, a family member. Uh, but you're dealing with almost 60% versus almost 50% when you leave the disability community. This is a community that wants to vote at home by mail or have that option. And, but notice that the country is with them. You have a majority of the country that now wants to vote home by mail, which is a huge change uh, from what we faced before. Uh, when we look, when we look at uh, you know changes in law um, that would take place in the in, in the country, uh, the you know everybody in your state uh, being able to vote by absentee ballot, uh, whether or not sick or uh, or, or absent or not, uh, is either those come down. It's two thirds that are for that. Everybody in your state automatically being mailed an absentee ballot. You know all, again almost two thirds and, and you know and and stable. So the country really does want to move to these fundamental you know, changes. Next slide. When you look at this data by the disability community, you know, it's even, you know, it's even, you know, it's even stronger. And so we're dealing with, you know, you know and, and it may be they will also want the option, but it, when we look to the left, people voting in person at a polling station, um, there you're dealing with, you know, 55% with a person with disability you know, jumps to 70% when you have everybody in the state being able to vote by absentee, regardless of sick with real, uh, real intensity. And you have similar patterns, uh, both for the person themselves who's disabled, as well as the family member, as well as the community. And so you have a lot of intensity, big majorities uh, that want to be, even the, you know, the reform that would be most powerful, everybody in your state being, voting by mail ballot. Um, has 64% support for the person with the dis disability. Now the government rescue, next slide. So there is amazing support, uh, you know, for the rescue uh, plan in the country. It's, you know, 86% support. Um, and uh, you'll see the reason uh, below, but it's the support level, you know, is more intense with Republicans um, because a lot of people really don't know, you know, the process by which this plan was produced, a, a lot of this happened in private negotiations uh, between Speaker Pelosi and the, and, the, and the White House with Republicans being forced to go along with it. Let's go to the next slide. Look, this rescue plan produced a pretty amazing transfer of money. Um, um, in terms of, and the most, uh, and the biggest impact was in direct payments um, into people's checking accounts. You know, here you see, you know, 54% who got direct payments, you know, 70% with someone they you know. know. Uh, we, uh, similarly with unemployment insurance, um, you have 6%, someone they know, we'll, we'll be checking whether it's actual household, uh, SBA loans, uh, you know, as well. Go to the next slide. You know, we track in this the whether someone could afford a five hundred dollar expense. That's kind of a you know, it's kind of real kind of gut um, you know capacity, and there was a pretty amazing thing that happened. We had this crash uh, in, in health and uh, and economic crash in the country, and the fact that you went from two they went from two thirds to three quarters who can afford five hundred dollars and a drop from a third to a quarter of not being able to. Um, and if we look across the, you know, the range of many of the target audiences for progressive audiences, you know, Hispanics, it got to 64%, unmarried women, you know, 62%, you know, white working class women, 72%. Uh, that the, but we also need to remember the 26% who couldn't afford $500, even with that transfer. And what that says is somebody's missed. And we will, you know, we'll be doing further questions in the next tracking on whether people uh, are uh, going to food banks, where they uh, had access to it, um, and, 
and whether they use food stamps for the first time and other, other things related to that 25% because it's not acceptable that you have an increase in poverty, which may be showing up in that number. Next slide. When you look, uh, when you look at who's uh, who created, uh, who's responsible for this package, which clearly was transformative and will obviously be evolved both nationally and how the states administer it. Uh, what you see is that the, the Senate and House, uh, including the governors, have about 77% of the responsibility, 39% President Trump and Republicans. Uh, but the big number is, you know, is the 23% who don't know, which is quite extraordinary given the scale of what just happened in the country. Go to the next one. And what you see is when you ask whether you trust you know, the, you know, the national leaders of the Democratic side or the national leaders on the Republican side. Uh, Democrats have about a six point advantage uh, in this survey, which is about the same as the, the generic vote in this. So it's not, you know, there's no, there's no particular advantage that the Democrats have, uh, even though they obviously played a central role in, in producing the kind of impact uh, that we're talking about. Next slide. Now, most critical is what happens now. You know, what kind of changes need to happen now uh, in the country to really. And we're also looking at extraordinary levels of support. You know, we're looking at 90% support um, for purchase, purchase the crops of farmers and use the trucks to transfer those food banks to the cities, allowing people who use uh, 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 SNAP to be able to order and pay for groceries and deliveries online, so they don't have to go into stores. <clears throat> Create a government funded program of the 12 weeks of paid family leave for anyone who can, can't work because of the coronavirus, 500 billion to create 12 million jobs with infrastructure, 500 billion for state and cities to pay for police and fire. Again, we're dealing with 90% levels of support. These have all gone up about six points from where they were three weeks ago. So you have, a, right now the country wants government to act and, and act in, uh, in big ways. It is pretty extraordinary. That SNAP would be the second highest um, uh, with a very high level of intensity, 54% you know, strongly, 46% overall. But uh, if you go to rising American electorate, working women, uh, it's 50% or 29% of Republicans on SNAP. Uh, we also see how this then plays out for the disability community. And just under, understand that food stamps, by the way, we asked, I, I'm sure this is because Jennifer was cautious. <laughs> I know pot food stamps are popular. <laughs> the, uh, people talk about SNAP uh, and, and, but, and are reluctant to use the word food stamps, but not the American people. Uh, food stamps are enormously popular, favorable view. Uh, this is a little bit more neutral uh, when you ask on a web survey versus a phone survey, but it's a net plus 11 in favor and positive for food stamps. Uh, but note how strong that is for a person with disability uh, or the, and the disability community, uh, where it's a net plus 30. So, it, but still, overall in the country, it's, you know, it's plus 11. Go to the next slide. Because now we go to the way the disability community is, you know, responding, uh, you know, to these, you know, to these different policy options. And what you see is that, being able, again, purchase the crops of farmers and getting them uh, to food banks in the cities, you know, is, um, um, you know, is at the top. Um, but if you also look to the, the next two programs, SNAP, being able to you know order and pay for groceries and delivery online, so they don't have to go to the stores. Uh, Eighty-four percent, fifty percent, you know, you know, have strongly favor. Uh, but noticing that the credit government-funded program of paid family leave, who can't afford uh, work because of it, has the strongest support. Now they're very close together, uh, and they stand out from the two others, and it's obvious. You know that you know dealing with the kind uh, kind of health care that uh, is assured in time of um, of you know health need, um, quite strong sensitivity sensitivity to it. But it's also worth noting, I mean, just we should dwell on the fact that these overwhelming numbers they're stronger in the public overall. 
it's not the dis, it's not just the disability community that wants to see these huge changes. They look identical to the uh, to the uh, to the country as a whole in wanting these big changes to happen. And I'll talk I'll talk briefly about the pres uh, presidential race, but it's uh, just just a note that the um, you know the presidential race you know for pres for uh, Vice President Biden um, he has a five point lead. He's had down a bit. Now that that would be a very you know that would be a, a very strong race, but close in the electoral college potentially, uh, because the that this five point lead in the battleground, uh, it's three points in uh, what are the blue wall states, kind of the Midwest states from going from Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, then up to New Hampshire and Maine. Um, you know, there is you know his lead uh, is is three points, and those are the states you know that he has to win that to go over the top on the electoral college. So it's it's not you know given, and as a poll in which the generic congressional is very strong at plus seven and very strong, you know, in the Senate races. Uh, in looking at that, I'm going to end with this slide because it's um, uh, it tells a very big story about what's happening in the uh, in the country. Because if you look at the presidential vote. Um, for person with disabilities, you know, or, you know, or the disability community, uh, you're dealing with a very big lead um, for President Biden. If you look at the generic congressional vote, um, you're looking at a huge 24 point lead in the in, in the generic congressional, 17 in, in the disability community, and that's much bigger than the four point lead for the non disability. You know, these numbers are almost double what they were a month ago, the margin. When we presented this in the past, the, we have shown the disability community to be slightly more democratic and not, you know, not in a fundamental way, just slightly more democratic. But we're dealing with a, we're dealing with a crisis in which, there were, in which people are facing healthcare issues um, that, are, you know, that are critical and we're also uh, policy changes that could affect them, such as the decision about food stamps. Um, and that may be reflected in a, in a shift in the, in the vote um, that's quite dramatic. Um, and, and I think ought to be in the backdrop, at least as the uh, elected leaders deal with the urgent issues uh, before the country. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stan. That was really um, fantastic. And I really want to um, thank the, the funders of the survey um, very much for enabling uh, this data to happen. Um, I want to ask you, Stan, were, were you surprised by any of this data, per se? Uh, it, the, look, the, the biggest surprise to me was the, uh, was the $500, you know, the everywhere else in the world, <laughs> which would have an economic crash. People are less, people are less secure. And what's, what that said was government is working. Now, it's missing people, <laughs> but <laughs> obviously, and, and you're more sensitive to that, but you know, it's, it, you know, it's missing people, uh, but, and, and it's producing a huge support for government acting and doing things um, that as this crisis unfolds, and as it unfolds longer, these problems are gonna deepen, uh, but people are looking for government to, you know, to address it. Um, and that was, you know, that was that was the that was the biggest piece that uh, surprised me in terms of the. Uh, I was surprised that um, when we found that we had a quarter in the last poll that you know didn't know who was responsible for the rescue package. I thought that would, as as the it, it was administered, I thought you know I thought there would be more uh, recognition of how this process got produced because it would not have happened. The things we that have improved their lives, like unemployment insurance. Uh, the way the direct payments were done was only because of the um, Speaker Pelosi and the, and the leadership that House Democrats did in, uh, in shaping the package. But that's not that's kind of invisible. Uh, the uh, and I was surprised by the uh, the shift in the vote uh, for the you know, President Biden has slipped down a bit. He hasn't consolidated uh, Democrats with a very incomplete primary. But the the shift in the disability community, heavily to the Democrats, is very is very new. Everything we've seen before has been kind of a slightly more democratic uh, community, and whatever poll we do is kind of the same. This changed, 
you know, over the last month, obviously they're very alert, you know, to how this is playing out. It, uh, I was really surprised by that data because, um, you know, Stan, you and other pollsters have been working with us on, on these issues. And, and I think the first poll you did with us is probably six years ago. And we've seen again and again and again that the disability community was very split from a partisan perspective where very, um, very even between Democrats and Republicans mm -hmm. uh, time after time after time. Uh, we also saw in your exit poll that you did on election night for the last presidential, a, a, you and Celinda Lake both saw a tiny uh, larger vote for Trump than uh, for Hillary Clinton. And it seemed to be linked to uh, sort of those wrong track moments that they, people mm -hmm. with disabilities were so disenfranchised, they really, really wanted to blow up the system. And there was a slight lean towards Trump in, in, in that. And so to see this a very, very big uh, shift in, in a four week period of time um, for uh, voters with disabilities in these swing states to move towards uh, the Democratic Party, when overall we did not see uh, much of a change. I mean, the people without disabilities, it seemed that jo Joe Biden was perhaps losing a little yeah. bit of ground. Is that, is that correct? Yes. No, he, no, he lost ground uh, in the, which surprised me because the primary was over. He was endorsed, you know, he was endorsed, you know, by the, his opponents. And so while it was, it was kind of invisible, the primary had come to an end and I just thought naturally you know, you have consolidation and, and, and other polls have shown, you know, movement toward Biden, you know, but this is in the, in the battleground. And so we've shown a little slippage, but you know, not, you know, it's, it's two points, but the biggest, one of the biggest changes in this poll is, is the reaction of the disability community. Well, there are two key issues that you were um, talking about that were particularly important to our community. The first of which was this access to food stamps, which as you saw was more popular in the disability community than the non-disabled community. And, and, and that is very logical because it is so difficult for people with disabilities to get jobs. They're mm -hmm. um, so often not in the workforce that they experience poverty at a much higher rate and therefore they're much larger consumers of SNAP. You've got this 11 million people with disabilities that um, use SNAP. So, um, but what was also interesting to me that it was the support for SNAP and for home delivery and online use of SNAP and the food stamps was very bipartisan. Um, what, what do you make of the Republican support um, for the use of online SNAP and, um, and for the ability to have home food delivery and also that question of uh, getting the food from farmers to uh, to food banks. You're, uh, you're right. You're, look, you're right. The emphasis because the, look, the overall narrative of this is this 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 partisan polarization is growing. I mean, other polls have shown it with the use of masks and other things to deal with the pandemic, and and the White House is you know is, appears to be reinforcing that so that the the big story, um, you know, is there, you know, but the, there are a couple things in which, you know, you, I mean, you still have a majority of Republicans, or right, I think right at a majority on, on who, um, who believe there ought to be no fault, allowed no fault, you know, voting uh, by absentee to have safer, you know, safer voting. Uh, the other piece is on both the, on both the food from agriculture, you know, and on, People being able to, to, to people being able to buy food on online. Um, on both of those, you get uh, Republican support, um, and so it's some measure of how important uh, it is. How just either common sense it is, but how important it is. Um, and both are unifying in some sense. Um, that uh, despite this polariz partisan polarization, there there are issues in which Democrats and Republicans can be supported. So it's, it's quite interesting that we still have 20 states where the governors have not asked the USDA to enable people to use their food stamps online and mm. for home delivery. Some of the governors in those states are Democrats mm. and some are Republicans. What, what is your message to the disability <laughs> community on what should we say to our governors who haven't even asked uh, to make that uh, happen for us. 
Well, the first is they should use this poll. They should send this poll out to as, as widely as possible. And uh, but they should mobilize. I mean, they uh, and you're obviously one of the vehicles, you know, for that. Uh, but it's uh, it ought to be priority number one. I mean, you have one in five uh, who are, are disabled themselves, one in three who are um, uh, with family. I mean, the disabled community is in, is, has real scale and real need. Um, and it is just unimaginable that they are not putting this at the highest priority in terms of policy change. And they should use this data to, under, to bang and underscore how important this happened. Thank you. And, and then the, the, the thing about using SNAP online, there's not an extra price tag um, that is associated with it, but there is a price tag associated with online voting. There is a process that needs to happen. The first uh, you know, sort of bill after the COVID crisis did have some money for online voting, but it didn't mm -hmm. cover all of it. Um, what, what is your sense around those issues? Because I know there's still a conversation in Washington about providing the money that will enable people to have safe access to democracy and to voting. Look, I mean, I don't, I don't understand um, people being able to watch what happened in Wisconsin and, and not be motivated to um, change the law in order to facilitate uh, people being able to vote at home by uh, by mail. Um, I know, I know there are, you know, that there will be. Um, on the House side, you know, as as before, you know, proposal for additional funds to facilitate this. Uh, but I also, you know, if you watch what actually happened state by state, there are a lot of Republican governors who are moving on this out of necessity. And I think I think just as I think the layoffs get ha uh, happen in the public sector in any state, um, I think you're going to find that almost every governor is going to need to facilitate safe voting. And, uh, and I think it's possible that one will get bipartisan support for a bigger funding of this um, in the next package. Stan, you've worked a lot with marginalized communities, whether it's you know women or people of color, the LGBTQ community. And, and clearly some communities have been very successful in organizing. The disability community, given our large size, has not yet uh, reached uh, the potential that we have. Mm. If you were to look at other communities and their success, what are some of the lessons do you think we could learn um, from other communities that are trying to have more impact, more influence uh, to try and enable us to have a better future? I think resilience, persistence. Look, people got look, people have gotten, you know, when I, and, and when I look at the film at the beginning of this process, you know, the resilience to make the Eagle Scouts, the resilience uh, to succeed, to be able to go to work, you know, is, but you have to make that happen year after year. You know, you know, I watch and I, and I if I, I watch the African American community, you know, and I'll listen to focus groups um, with the African American community, watching Trump, watching what's happening. And they will, and I watch the kids too, not just the, the older. And they'll say, you know what, you know, our parents' generation, they, you know, they sacrifice everything that we be able to have this right to vote. Mm -hmm. And we now have, you know, we now, we, we may have stood by the uh, wayside and, and allowed, you know, Donald Trump to become president. You know, never again, we, you know, we have to be engaged. And I think where you see is that people have a, not just a sense of history, since you'd never let, let up, you just have to, you have to remain vigilant. And when you're not vigilant, you lose back, you fall back. And so it's, it's election after election, people understanding that your importance of your issue, but also your values um, and building support, you know, for the policies that are consistent with the values, but it's never giving up. And year on year, you know, keep fighting to push it for, you know, push the ball further. I, I so appreciate that. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I do want to invite uh, people to ask questions through the uh, Zoom chat if they want to. We don't have too much more time. Um, but I, I also want to ask Stan, are there any other big trends that you are seeing um, in the polling and the focus groups that you're doing? I mean, this big shift from 
uh, you know, people with disabilities being very much uh, in the center, you know, the same amount uh, Democrats as Republicans to now leaning significantly towards the Democratic Party. Are there any other big shifts that you're seeing out there that are worth watching? Look, I, look, I think the, I think the piece that, and it obviously is very important, to, I think, to the thinking about disability community. I think people, the, work, the, the working class, working people, are invisible to people. Uh, if, if I watch what's happening here, and if I watch what's happening, uh, you know, in Britain uh, and other countries, people begin to appreciate, first they appreciate the nurses and doctors who are in the healthcare system and the red, great risks they're putting to themselves. And then we have essential workers and discovers that it's, a, it's the clerks and the, it's, a, it's the grocery store or, the pe or people are picking up rubbish um, who are at risk because they're carrying on delivery. The uh, transport workers, um, you know, are you know are at greater risk. And there's in these moments, there's suddenly these people are visible. Mm -hmm. um, and the um, I think a lot of what produced the election of Donald Trump was not realizing how working people were dealing with the post-financial crisis. I think a lot of they, the fact they were invisible um, and, I, and we had a working class revolt that, uh, that produced, and by working class, I mean working, white working class revolt in support of Trump, but also African people of color not vote uh, because the people didn't see how much they had suffered, how much wealth they had lost, how, what, a, what a struggle life was those living in the, in, the, in the metropolitan areas did not see what was happening with working people right near them. Um, and the, now many of those voters have, you know, have become disillusioned and have moved back. But that happened in the midterm elections, but people just don't believe that working people have become disillusioned with Trump. They only focus on the rallies. They don't focus on working people around them. And so it's working people, I think, being invisible. Um, is central now to the narrative, given what's happening, and we now, re you know, realize how much we are dependent on working to everybody, um, and the, uh, but politically, uh, they matter as well. Uh, they have shifted uh, in their voting. Um, it's, you know, it's part of it's probably the most important reason um, the midterm blue wave happened was because of shifts of working people, white working. But the ones that we focused on was the shift of the suburbs. Mm -hmm. The reason we did is it required a small change for those seats to swing. But in fact, there was a 13 point swing of white working class men and women to the Democrats in the midterm elections. Uh, but people just didn't see it. And actually still don't believe that race baiting will work. But the, the fact is almost everything Trump has promoted um, in values terms, the country has come turned against. Go it alone, not working with other countries, uh, war on trade, uh, the immigration. The country has become incredibly more insistent on its immigrant and diverse culture um, and history um, in, in, in reaction against uh, Donald Trump. So I just want to remind our listeners that Respectability is a nonpartisan organization and that we don't lobby or endorse candidates. Um, we have a question from John Kelly who asked, the election likely will come down to just a handful of battleground states where electoral votes will determine the overall outcome. Do we know the size of the disability community in those states as compared to the number that actually vote? And if the newer de-leaning trend is statistically mm -hmm. large enough to begin leaning those states as well, assuming it remains through November, are we now a substantial enough that the candidates can clearly see that they should be courting the community as a voting block? Also, I assume the message, regardless of poll and candidate, is not to be comfortable, but rather to be as active as possible. Is that right? You know, your question, your question is right on the mark <laughs> uh, in this survey. So just noting this survey is a battleground state. So it's, you know, so it's, we're, you know, we're dealing with states, you know, like, you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, states like Florida, North Carolina, you know, Arizona, uh, it includes Virginia and Colorado that are more democratic, but it's, it's the 16 states, not, it'll be the states that actually do determine 
um, you know, whether the, the country flips the electoral college um, to elect a, I'm trying to elect a Democrat, but the, it'll be decided there. But if you believe this survey, uh, where Biden had only a three point lead, you know, in those blue wall states that elected Trump, um, this community, you know, is well. The families themselves, I think, are one third of you know of the uh, of of these. The disabled themselves are you know one in five, eighteen percent, in this battleground uh, survey. If they vote, you know, they swung the swing in this survey would have you know was was offsetting Biden's losses. And obviously, we'll look further, but I th hope they're looking at the survey because what this survey says is. They actually could decide this election. They are they are big enough. The disabled themselves, eighteen percent, this the doubling of their vote for Congress in this survey for the Democrats was enough to swing this election. So your answer to that question may be the same as it would be to this. But we do have a question from James Trout saying, "How can the disability community get the Biden campaign to address disability issues more explicitly?" He's addressed disabilities less than Hillary Rodham Clinton did four years ago. So I'll, I'll just note there was a New York Times story that uh, said that the um, that I was briefing the the, the uh, some some uh, you know Biden advisors. I promise you. So my promise today is that I will add the disability slides to any future briefings so they can see them as well. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, respectability is nonpartisan. We'll be releasing these slides nationally. We will obviously send them to both political parties at all level and encourage all candidates to support uh, key issues like access to food and access to safe um, to safe voting. I really want to um, thank uh, Stanley Greenberg for, for being with us. Was there something I should have asked you, Stan, or something you wanted to communicate to our group? um before uh we sign off here uh the um just to um i'll just reiterate the um that persistence it, you know it obviously people know it personally and the but it's also persistence as a community but it's also a reminder to myself to uh to constantly bring them into the narrative because they are integral to our lives Thank you. I want to thank uh, the Voter Participation Center for funding this large scale survey for including the disability demographic in that survey. Uh, generally, polls that are done are done without uh, asking the disability demographic question. We obviously would like to see all polls do that. So I really, really, really am so grateful to the um, Voter Participation Center for doing that and for letting uh, Stan brief us here today. I wanna thank uh, our board member, Oli Cantos, for sharing his personal story about himself and his triplets, all three of whom are 20 years old, have been uh, battling this COVID virus and thank goodness uh, that they are on the mend. I do agree, Stan, with you that the resilience of our community is a very powerful force that can bring us forward. I wanna thank Stanley Greenberg and the entire Team Greenberg uh, team for being a part of this. Wanna let everybody who's a listener know, if Eric, if you could bring up the slide, um, that we have many upcoming events that are coming up um, that you can find on our website. So there is um, an event page that has uh, our upcoming events, including we have a convening for people who use wheelchairs that are coming up. We have many Hollywood events that are coming up. Um, many, many other events that we have, and you can find those on our event uh, pages. And you can also find a number of COVID resources, uh, particularly for people with disabilities on our website. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me at Jennifer M at respectability.org. Um, we're a nonprofit organization and our mission is to fight stigmas and advance opportunities for people with disabilities. At this time, uh, helping keep people with disabilities alive during this pandemic, the CDC has reported numerous times that 90% of COVID 
hospitalizations are people with underlying um, conditions, that's people with disabilities. This is our community. And as Stan said, there's a lot of us and we really need to be active. I wanna also thank Lauren Applebaum and Eric Asher and our team for their work on this SNAP issue. Tomorrow we will be issuing a big press release around the SNAP issue and inviting people to uh, write to their elected officials on these issues as well. Stan Greenberg, thank you very much. I wanna thank our sign language interpreters and our live captionists as well. And I wanna wish everybody a wonderful, a wonderful day. Thank you all for joining us. And if you have any questions, please be in touch. Thank you.